Welcome back to In the Midst. Today, I wanna to share some thoughts from Daniel chapters one through three. Um, this is a story, an account um, that most of us know, we're familiar with. Um, you're shaking the table. We know all that Daniel went through. We know that he was taken captive um, into Babylonian captivity. Um, there was, you know, three others, two others, um, three others with him, sorry. Um, so I want to talk about this. I want to share. Um, I read through this in my devotions a little while back. Um, I've started back over in the Bible. I haven't made it back to Daniel yet. And then our pastor recently did a study on Daniel, literally like verse by verse. And it really helped me to understand a lot more, especially in those later chapters with all the prophecy and Daniel's, you know, the 70 weeks and all that. Um, but today I'm just going to focus on the first three chapters. And I hope that this is a help and an encouragement to you. There's a, so much in here, okay? So this portion of scripture, like I said, is familiar. And unfortunately, sometimes when, familiar, when scripture gets familiar, we just tend to gloss over it. We read it and we're like, yeah, I know, um, you know, next. We're just checking off that box to say, I read the Bible today. And I don't want you to do that. I don't want you to get complacent with scripture or with your scripture reading, okay? Um, so chapter one, verse three refers to Daniel, Hananiah, Michelle, Mishael, and Azariah as children. Um, they were young men. And we see that Daniel was of royal birth, yet he, we see all three of four of them go into uh, Babylonian captivity. Remembering that they are young men is important. These are not, in our day and time, you know, 20, 25 year old men. Um, I think they said Daniel 17 or so maybe um, is how old he was when he got taken into captivity. Um, we can speculate, but we're just going to stay with scripture. But I think when our pastor went through this, he said about 17, but don't hold me to that. Chapter 1 verse 8 tells us that Daniel purposed in his heart not to defile himself with the king's meat or the wine. A young man, especially 17 in a foreign place, does not just decide to be different okay he was probably fearful there was a lot of unknowns um no one just wants to be taken in captivity and to rem be removed from their home their parents everything they knew you know it's not like he had a cell phone where he could be like hey somebody come get me tell me what's going on um as we read later on in scripture he never went back home again he never saw his parents his family again so that's scary so when you're in, I want you to remember that these guys had the same, you know, thoughts, fears, and emotions as we do today. They, they were just young men. You know, a lot of you have kids, you have teenagers. If your 16, 17, 18 year old was just taken from your home, taken somewhere else, no cell phone, no extra clothes, and they were told, this is where you're going to sit. This is what you're going to eat. This is what you're going to drink until we say so. Would they have the courage to say, God said, I can't have that, so I don't want it. He didn't know where his next meal was going to come from. You know, when Daniel said to the jailer, the man that was over them, that, you know, I don't want this. Can I have something else? He could have been killed for that, just for refusing the king's meat. Back then, the king was everything, and you just did what the king said. That was just the culture. But he took a stand, and he said, I don't want this. Um... So he was raised with the standard of right and wrong, and his parents raised him according to the law of God, what they had at that time. So I want to ask you a question. How are we raising our children? Do they know that we live by God's standards? Do we live by God's standards? Are we trying to raise them by God's standards? If they were taken out of your home, are they going to know if they're out with their friends, you know, just being away from you, are they going to be able to recognize certain behaviors, certain practices they might participate, but they, are they at least going to know this isn't right? This isn't aligning with God's word. Or is it something that, oh, mom and dad never talked about. We never knew. And we just did what seemed right in our own eyes. Um, we must be grounding ourselves in the word of God so that, we, so that way we can raise our children founded on that same basis. Verses 17 through 21, we see that first Daniel and his friends had the courage to ask the prince of the eunuchs for food that was acceptable for them to have, even though, like I said, it's not what the king offered. Um, they could have easily said that this situation was temporary. For now, we'll just do what's here. We'll do what's easy. We'll be like everyone else. But they didn't mind to be different than those around them. 
even if it meant doing right. So for this, that we, we're going to see God's blessing and provision here shortly. If we go to chapter 2, verse 5, we see King Nebuchadnezzar was asking for something humanly impossible. But if you go back to chapter 1, verse 17, we see that God gave Daniel understanding in all visions and in all dreams. Chapter 2, verse 18, Daniel holds a prayer meeting. He knows that God can reveal the dream and its meaning to him. He's fully relying on God. God is all that he's had since you know he got taken into this captivity. And he has already seen God work because God gave him favor with the prince of the eunuchs. And they met those dietary needs that he had asked for. Um, so here we also learn that nothing is hidden from God. It was hidden to all the wise men, all the magicians, all of that that Nebuchadnezzar had already called. And they were like, we can't pull this, you know, just out of the air. But Daniel said, God knows. And he did. So the king, you know, didn't even remember his dream enough to tell the men what it was. But God knew. James 4, 2 reminds us that we have not because we ask not. Daniel knew God was all that he needed. He knew God was able. And he didn't hesitate to ask God. God was not his last resort. Chapter 2, verse 19, Daniel um, immediately blesses God for answering him. Too often, this is something we forget. We ask God, we get that answer, that blessing, and go on with life. We forget to stop and thank God for what he's done. Um, chapter 2, verse 28, but God. That is all we need, but God. Daniel tells the king where the answer came from. He was the only one that called upon God. He was the only one that we see that had a relationship with God, but he publicly said, God did this. Are you publicly sharing with others what God has done for you? That is what people need to see. You know, the world, a lot of them know about God or know of him. They've heard of him. Um, a lot of them even take his name in vain, but he's not a real able person. He's your preference. He's a figment of your imagination. He's, you know, a crutch that people used to get through life. He's not a real person to them. But when we are able to stand and say, God did this, and this is how I know it was God. This is what I prayed for, and this is what God did. When we give them those solid truths that aren't just luck and happenstance, that gives them something to go, oh, Nothing like that's ever happened in my life. What's different? Maybe there is something. Maybe God is real. And it piques their interest. And the Holy Spirit can use that to call them and yield, you know, get them to yield to him and draw them to himself. I'm sure that Daniel was influenced by his parents. Do your children hear you praying and praising God for what he's done? You know, our children absolutely have to see this. Our faith needs to be real or they're not going to want anything to do with it. You know, your children are not ignorant. They see your life. They see you at church. But is it the same? Is it real? It's easy to raise your hand and worship, you know, at church. But what about when you get home? Are you reading your Bible? Are you praying? Are you praising him? Are your children seeing your walk lived out as if it's something real? Because it is something that they need and they need to see. Um, chapter 2, verse 47, Nebuchadnezzar recognizes Daniel's God as the God of gods and Lord of lords, or Lord of kings, and he instructs everyone to worship him. Daniel stands for God, influenced Nebuchadnezzar, which in turn influenced a whole country. Millions of people now know who the God of gods is. Um, chapter 2, verses 49, Daniel is promoted by the king, and his request for his friends to be promoted is granted. God protected and blessed them for their obedience and faithfulness to him. This is the only way for us to get God's blessing. We have to be obedient. We have to be faithful. We have to trust him. Um, you know, we have to recognize his working in our lives, even if we don't see it right now. But hopefully in a week, in a month, you can look back and go, oh, there it is. I see what God did. And we have to share that again with our kids, with those around us. You know, if you're asking someone to pray for you because you're in a hard place, you're struggling with your faith, whatever it is, when that answer comes, when God delivers, when God, you know, gives anything, I hope you go back to them and you say, thank you for praying for me. Don't stop. Um, 
But so far, this is what God's done. This is how God has answered because God is answering their prayer too, not just yours. And they need, you know, to see that that's going to strengthen their faith, not just ours. Um, even in the midst of trial, especially in the midst of trial, Daniel and his friends chose to follow God before they were ever taken into captivity, not after. You know, you're not going to decide most of the time in that trial to go, oh, okay, now I really need to follow God. They were just living out of faith that they already had. They were standing on principles that they already had. They were just staying on the foundation that had already been made. Um, you know, don't wait until the trials to follow God. We must decide this now so our faith isn't shaken, at least not as much. Otherwise, that foundation is going to completely crumble. We get into chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar turns to idol worship. He just said, Daniel's God is the God of gods, and everyone's going to worship him. And just a few verses later, we're back to idol worship. He quickly forgot the words that he had just spoken. Unfortunately, sometimes we're like Nebuchadnezzar. You know, we might give our heart to the Lord on Sunday at the altar, and we're going to say that, you know, we're going to do better, we're going to live for him, we rededicate our lives, and... Next month when the finances are hard, we we stop. Next month when things just don't seem to add up or that trial comes to your marriage or someone gets sick, it's not taken to the Lord. We're not praying like we should. We're not reading our Bible anymore. We're trying to figure things out on our own and we're trying to, and I'm not saying you shouldn't, you shouldn't be diligent and be a wise steward and all that, but God is still God even in those trials, even when things don't make sense, even when, you know, it seems like, you know, God's forgotten you. He hasn't. He's promised to never leave us nor forsake us. Um, we must remember that and continue to be faithful to him, you know, even when things don't add up. Um, Nebuchadnezzar was so focused on his idol that he now wants anyone killed that doesn't bow down to this idol, including the men that he just promoted. Sometimes we have a short memory just like he does. You know, when you read through the Old Testament and you see the um, children of Israel doing that, don't be too hard on them because our hearts do the same thing. Verse 15, the end of the verse, Nebuchadnezzar says, But if you worship not, you shall be cast the same hour into the burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Did he really forget God's existence by saying, who is that God? Or did he really just question God's abilities? Because now he thinks he's higher than that. And there's no one or nothing that can, um, you know, overtake his power and his abilities. So I hope that you don't have these same thoughts. I hope that you don't forget God's existence or God's abilities when it comes to your own life. This is another reason that we have to share our praises one with another because when our faith is weak, we can stand on someone else's and we have to stay in scripture and we will get to know the character of God, the heart of God. God isn't just something up here that doesn't make sense. He's not a far off God. He wants you to know his heart, his attributes. He wants you to be able to see his hand in your life. We're going to have questions. But hopefully it's not that, to the point we're questioning God's existence completely. Um, verses 17 and 18, they had already decided to follow God again before the trial came. Their faith wasn't shaken. And they were not changing their stance, even at the top of the fiery furnace. That's a big trial. They're going to be burned alive if God doesn't intervene. And they were okay with that. They said... Pretty much, you know, even if not, God is still good. We're not going to deny him. We're not going to question him. If we perish, we perish. You know, Esther said the same thing. So if we die in this furnace, we're going to be delivered because we're going to be in heaven. And okay, what more could we ask for? But if not, and we get thrown into here and he doesn't deliver us that way, he's going to physically deliver us and we're going to walk out of here. They were okay either way. With whatever God had for them, they were fully surrendered, fully accepted, fully trusting, even though they didn't understand. They weren't standing at the top going, God, we served you and we trusted you. Why are you letting this happen? They said, okay, God's going to be glorified either way and we're going to be delivered either way. And that's something that we have to remember in our trials. When someone's hurting, 
someone's sick, you're sick. Um, you know, lots of you have had parents or spouses or even children that were sick. They had, you know, cancer or something and they died. And that's what you were left saying is, but God, I prayed. God, I asked you to heal them. He did. Your prayer was fully, completely answered, more fully than it could have been on earth had their life been spared. They have the ultimate healing, being in heaven. Your prayer was answered. It's not always answered the way we want it to be because we want our loved ones to stay here. But that doesn't mean that God did, didn't answer, that God wasn't faithful. Verse, verse 22, the king's men died at the mouth of the fiery furnace because of the king's commandment to increase the heat. Your choices affect other people. These men died because the king was so angry that he wasn't being worshipped. Your sin does not only affect you, it affects everyone around you. There were wives left as widows. There were children left fatherless because of the king's anger that men died because of this. This is a big deal. Your anger literally can kill someone. Um, and now it not only affected the men, it affected their family. So many people were affected just because the king said, turn the heat up. They were burned alive in an instant. You are not the only one who's affected by the consequences of your choice. You are free to make your own choices, but you are not free to choose the consequences of your choices. Um, the men died that day. You cannot choose the consequences of your actions. You don't know who's going to be affected and to what degree. Only God knows that. Do you think the king would have chosen to continue to stay angry? Would he have turned the heat up if he knew that his men were going to die? Maybe. I don't know. But there, now there's nothing that he can do. He can't go back and change that. But verse 3, or chapter 3, verse 25 is still in the Bible. The men were loosed from whatever was used to bind them up because God is a God of freedom, not of bondage. That is the God that we serve. God's might was shown for all to see. Nebuchadnezzar makes a decree again that God is to be worshipped and the men are to be promoted back um, to the positions. So when we are faithful as they were, even in trials, others see God through us. We get to decide how we respond. And this should be the desire of every Christian. It's not always easy at all. God rewards faithfulness every time. Whether it's here or in glory, your faithfulness, your obedience is rewarded and seen by others. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were 100% sold out for God. They were not looking for a way out. They did not have a plan B. They simply said, if it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods or worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Nothing was going to happen to make them renounce God, to, to deny their faith, to deny their Lord, and to say, Okay, Nebuchadnezzar will worship your statue. Nothing could have happened to make them say that. Their but if not was not an exit plan or a doubt. They did not doubt God's ability. They were willing to accept God's will for them. Whether they were delivered or they were martyrs, they were okay with that. They, were, they knew they'd wake up in heaven if God um, did not deliver them here. So can you think of a better deliverance? I can't. I mean, heaven okay, are the trials that we face really that bad? When you think of what some of our, you know, forefathers went through, the people in scripture, other people, Polycarp and other people like that, um, that were following Christ, what they went through, what they endured, is that really that much compared to our life, our trials? Some of us, it is. Some of us, it's right up there with them, the persecution, um, and all of that. But just like them, we are able to say if we will choose. But if not, God is able. You know, it doesn't matter what you're going through. God is there. He is able to deliver. He knows exactly where you are in that trial. Um, he has a plan. He has a purpose for it. Maybe it is deliverance here on earth. 
Maybe it's deliverance and glory. I don't know. But all trials are temporary. All of them. It doesn't seem that way. Some of them seem to go on forever. But this life isn't forever. So the trials are not forever. But God is. And we can trust him. Do not lose sight of heaven. Don't lose sight of Christ and his abilities and his faithfulness. This is why we must be in our Bibles. We must be praying. We must remember the trials that others went through, what God did, their attitude, their reward, the result, all of that. That's why God has given us his word because he never changes. We can claim those same promises. I hope you will choose today to follow the Lord completely and trust him with whatever trial it is that he has you in right now. Stay in the word, stay close to the shepherd, and let him lead you in paths of righteousness.